Well, welcome once again to Voice of Reason Radio. Your host, Chris Honholtz, joining you not with Richard Story. <laughs> As you can see, I have someone else with uh, with me on today's podcast, a uh, uh, another member of the Christian podcast community, and we'll uh, talk with him in just a second. But I want to thank you for joining with us this week. I apologize for the delay last week. Uh, if some of you saw uh, the social media post, we had a recent passing in my family. Uh, uh, my dear stepmother, who had bought battled uh, Alzheimer's for well over 12 years, uh, was brought home to be with the Lord. And uh, while we celebrate the fact that she is with Christ now and worshiping her Savior face to face, uh, obviously, we all mourn and, and her her absence here. So thank you for that time. Thank you for praying for our family. Thank you for just being patient with us as 2024 has been rather hectic for, for both the Honholtz and Story households. So thank you as always. And I want to remind you, as I just said, we are part of the Christian podcast community, as is our guest, and it is one of those places that you can go that you can be certain that what you're going to be listening to is sound, it's biblical, uh, it's going to have a variety of positions, a variety of different topics that they're going to cover, but you can at least know that when you get in there and you're looking at the various podcasts, you know that it's been vetted, and it's not some weird fly-by-night pseudo-Christian programming, uh, which is what takes up so much of Christian podcasting these days. So please feel feel free to check that out. I also want to encourage you to go to slavetothekingcom That is our website where I've been doing more writing. I've been promising you guys I would do that, and I'm finally starting to get around to it. It's also the links to our social media, uh, including our YouTube page. I know some of you are finding that now, now that we're trying to expand our use of that particular uh medium and platform. So uh, if you're a YouTube person who you prefer that uh, that way of listening to a program, um, check us out. That'll, that'll be on our page as well. So uh, with no other uh, announcements to, to give, I want to invite a, a you to listen to and, and engage with our, our good friend here, Gene Clyatt, also known as Shinar Squirrel on uh, Twitter, if you follow him. And he is uh, the host of Squirrel Chatter Podcast, which you can catch every morning. He uh, streams live to uh, Twitter and I believe also on YouTube and stuff. Uh, and so you guys should tune in. His, his He does a great show. You just got to get up a little early. If you're on our side of the country, uh, it's 630 uh, for on my side over here on the West Coast, but uh, up there in the piney woods of Montana, it's a little bit later, but uh, I think you'll you'll always be blessed by it if you want to catch it live. But uh, Gene, welcome uh, on the show. Glad to have you on here, brother. Hey, Chris, it's, it's good to be here with you. Uh, enjoying a beautiful sunny day here in the piney woods. It's been <laughs> gorgeous today. I think it got up almost to 70 and sunny. And uh, we had a beautiful day yesterday for Easter, so it's been a good, good week this week. Uh, we had snow last week, so <laughs> it's spring yeah. in the spring in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's like coming from us and then finding its way to you because I'm usually complaining and then within a twelve to twenty four hours, so are you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you you are just a little bit west of me, uh, <laughs> uh, southwest. But I think the the weather does flow from the west coast. Yeah, across so. both. Yeah, it's well, like I say, it's it's really good to have you here, and it's gr it's great to have you on because we've known each other for years, uh, a long time. Uh, long time, and uh, unfortunately, so, well as well enough for you to have introduced me to a very strange genre of music at our first trip to Shepherd's Conference together. Swedish techno music, Swedish yeah. techno music, the the uh, the the, the uh, purple cow of ten minutes of Swedish techno music about a purple cow. I, try I, try I, to go to sleep to that, folks. It, it's not easy. Look on your face. I, I, <laughs> we were we were roommates at uh, in the pink suite at the Butler House. So much pink. <laughs> we, were, we were sharing the twin beds in the girls' rooms who had been relegated to the couch while we were there. <laughs> and um, the room was was very pink. Yes. And just to to get Chris, I decided to. Tell him that I like to go to go to sleep to Swedish techno music. <laughs> it was a song from a insurance ad <laughs> about dancing with a purple cow, and somebody had put together a ten minute loop of it on on uh, YouTube, and so I just put that on to play it, and acted like I was about to go to sleep, and 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 just looked over and saw the look on your face, and you were just, what have I gotten myself? <laughs> 
Well, if that, if the if the if the drive down wasn't enough, the the, the music definitely cemented my my opinions at that point. I think the the best thing though is <clears throat> my order number at McDonald's on the way back. Yes, it was the uh, the order of the Antichrist, as I recall. Yes, I had, I, my order number was six six six. I still have that receipt, by the way. I'm not <laughs> sure where it is, but I kept that. Well, Jay, I just recall we posted it, and James White about rolled his eyes clean out of his head. <laughs> I, we can oh, actually hear trip. it on Twitter. <laughs> that was a good trip. Yeah, that yeah, was. <clears throat> but it's a great trip, and and uh, folks, Gene is such a. He was really, in my opinion, a gift to the church. He really does understand the Word of God. He has a passion for preaching, and um, he is uncompromising in that regard. Yet, brother, the heart of a shepherd, I, I have watched you speaking on a variety of issues and the way that you take to presenting the Word of God, talking to people. The one thing that I wish so many newer voices that have found a platform on social media would model themselves after because there is an angst and an anger that's out there that I believe is inappropriate for people in that station. And you model exactly the opposite of what I think is the biblical way of of doing things. And I, I think I just froze my screen. Oh, yeah, good. You're, I'm still I, hearing you. Though, I, you... That's good. Well, well, hopefully the screen will not leave me in this weird frozen position for very long. So we'll see, folks. Uh, this could get interesting fast. Uh, but I, I'm so grateful to, that you do that. Um, I'm going to do a quick see if I can do something with my screen here. Uh, but, 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 but anyway, brother, while I'm fighting with my screen, I, I know we want to talk about the fact that um, uh, we're going to talk about the local church and what that means and joining a local church. So why don't you go ahead and talk about that while I fight with my camera? <laughs> Well, you and I were involved very recently in a discussion about what is the church and being being the importance of being a part of a local church. And in that discussion, somebody asked, you know, what is a church? What is a good church? How do you find a good church? And all of these are important questions that I think we've all gotten many times over the years uh, as as we've spread out across the country, but we have instant communication all around the, the world, really. There, you're, you're, I'm always getting people contacting me. I can't find a good church here. Is there a good church near me? Can you help me find a church? And I know I'm not alone. Um, a lot of people get those questions all the time. And so we try to, you know, help them as best we can. And there are, you know, church search engines that, that are generally trustworthy. You can look at a, you know, go to a good seminary um, and search for, for, you know, alumni led churches in that might be in your area. And that's all helpful, but none of it is foolproof. The, the only way to find a good church is to go and sit in the pew and talk to the, the pastors and learn about the church. Um, but I think we should start with what is that, that first big question, what is the church? And the, the, the church Catholic, to use the technical term, the, not, I'm not talking about Roman Catholicism, I'm talking about the, the universal church. Um, excuse me, one of my pet peeves is people who call the Church of Rome the Catholic Church. The reformers never did that. Uh, if you go back and 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 Calvin and Zwingli and 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 Cranmer and those guys, they did not give Rome the right to be called Catholic. They said Rome is outside the Catholic Church. Rome is not part of the church because they had denied the gospel. Um, so the the Catholic Church is the church of the true believers. And so the, the church Catholic is composed of all those who have come by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the forgiveness of their sins. It began at Pentecost when Peter preached Christ risen and 3,000 souls were saved. Acts 2.41 says that those 3,000 souls were added. Added to what? They were added to the church. 
So that is where the, the church of Jesus Christ began. It's when Peter preached Christ risen and called for the people to repent. And, and that day, 3,000 people were added, which also tells you that somebody was keeping track of those people. They knew how many there were. It wasn't just an amorphous mob. So while there is this great universal church that every Christian is a part of automatically, um, there's also local gatherings of Christians, which we call churches. So we need to distinguish between the, the great, big, invisible church, which is every Christian, and the smaller, local, visible churches, which is a group of believers who are covenanted together to be a body of Jesus Christ, to be a local church. And so, you know, that's where the question is, what makes a gathering of people a church? Um, I turn to uh, Article 19 of the 39 Articles of the Anglican Church, which are actually a very reformed document, if you ever look at it. Um, this was Thomas Cranmer um, before he was burned at the stake by Bloody Mary. He uh, um, was the architect of the... It's not, it's not what the Church of England became. Um, if if uh, Mary had not been queen and had not stomped out a lot of that, the, the Church of England would have ended up being a lot more reformed than what Elizabeth put together. I think we've, I've talked about that before, but <laughs> um, but the 30, uh, Article 19 of the 39 Articles, the title of that article is Of the Church. Um, it says, the visible church of Christ, so it's the visible church, it's talking about a local church, it's not talking about, you know, the church universal. The visible church of Christ is a congregation of faithful men. And remember, this is written in the early 17th century, so this is not talking about, or actually 16th century, so this is not talking about, you know, males. The, the men was used in this sense of men and women. This is the generic man. So it's a, a congregation of faithful men in which the pure word of God is preached and the sacraments, the sacraments be duly ministered according to Christ's ordinance in all those things that are that of necessity are requisite to the same. So they, they, they have three things here. Now, the first thing is this is the 19th article out of 39 articles. So it's about halfway through the list. <laughs> And Articles 1 through 18 have covered God, the Trinity, man's sin, Christ's deity, Jesus's substitutionary death, burial, resurrection, the sufficiency of Scripture. All of those things have been covered, so we're, we're, we have to presume those things when we talk about their definition of the church. Um, so in this 19th article, it gives us three things. The pure word of God is preached, and that is that is so important. It's it's not the 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 preaching element of the church is not man's ideas or funny stories or anything like that. It's it's you know simply put, reading the Bible and talking about what it says, not talking about right. what you think or what you want, and that's. Hey, you're moving. <laughs> yeah, it it took so anybody that's what you know, Gene could not see, and anybody that's watched the uh, the the YouTube video, you're probably watched. Why is there all these red and green lines as he's adjusting and pulling the camera bay and go back <laughs> into place? I I literally had to unplug the camera, plug it back in, and while oh, you were going through this this wonderful discussion, I, I I'm trying to actually make it look like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, hey, that worked. You got it fixed. So it's working so, again. <laughs> so keep going. Keep going. The teaching of the Word of God is 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 in so many ways the well. It's the central act of worship. Is the preaching of the Word. It's the 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 center of the life of the church. Is the preaching of the Word, and not just the preaching of sermons. It's the you know it's discipleship. It's instruction it's counseling 
you know, all of that has to be based on the word of God. Yeah. It's not based on, you know, what I think or what I want. It has to be what, what does the word of God say? Um, and, and just to, 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 start, uh, to yeah. interject on that real quick, I think that's one of the things that, especially in this day and age, that w- so many people are still truly, I hate to say it this way, ignorant of the the dearth of scriptural ignorance in, in what are called churches today is horrifyingly, you know, it, it's just horrifying how bad that is. And when you try to address it, when you try to point out how desperately we need the Word of God, that they will fight tooth and nail to argue that we don't, that it's just, we also need this, we also need that, we also need to bring in analytical tools or whatever else, because we can't put butts in the seats if, if we're just preaching the Word, yet it's that very word, you know, that God himself has ordained and, and, and inspired that informs us all the things that we're supposed to think, say, and do. And if you don't have a church that's willing to spend time in that, to not, not just, okay, let me find a verse that fits my preconceived idea of what I want to talk about, but rather what does the word say and what can I then number one, understand it as it was written, and then number two, how do I take that and apply it in the lives of the people in my church? And and, and as you say, not just from a preaching perspective, although that is a major component, but how do you counsel someone? How do you, you know, when people are facing life difficulties, how, uh, how do you counsel them Oh, well, we're going to go down the road to the therapist who rejects the Word of God? No, you you can counsel them from the Word of God. How do you train them to raise their children? How do you teach them about what it means to love as a husband or submit as a wife apart from the Word of God? And I think that is the, the one of the major components today is that, you know, some people say it's it's not a bug, it's a feature. I, I, I would agree that the the... Pro, what are professing churches today do everything they can to get away from the word of God. What, what it, would that be right? Yeah, I think it is. And, and one of the things is that, you know, you were talking about comforting people and my mind immediately flew to first Thessalonians where Paul is talking about, you know, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. And he says, use these words to comfort each other. What was he talking about? He's talking about the resurrection. Yeah. He's talking about the, the the return of the Lord and our resignation and uh, our resurrection to be with him forever. And that's going to be the comfort. That's that's what comforts us when we have a loved one who has passed, who is in the Lord. We grieve because they're not with us anymore. But we have hope that we will see them again. Um, I've done, you know, a lot of funerals as a, as a pastor. And... It, when you do the funeral of a believer, it's such a weird mingling of grief and joy. Yeah, because you're 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 joyful for the brother or sister; they're with the Lord. You know, the grief is for us because we don't get to spend time with them. Um, at the same time, I've done funerals for unbelievers, and it is. You talk about grief. Yeah. That's a hard, that's a hard thing to do. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we're called to do that as well. Yeah. Again, our recourse is to the Bible and, you know, we proclaim the gospel in that situation. As uh, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting because that's the end of all men and the wise consider this. And, and take it to heart. So, you know, the, but it's all has to be based on the word of God. Mm-hmm. And you're absolutely right is there has been a severe lack of biblical training in far too many churches. Yeah. Um, indeed. People, I was just thinking the other day, um, 
I don't know who posted, saw a thing on social media, and it was a, a scene from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And it's they're in history class. And the teacher asks, who was Joan of Arc? Oh, right. And Ted replies with Noah's wife. <laughs> now, here's the thing. That's a 40-year-old movie. That was back in the 80s, right? Mm-hmm. So 40 years ago, on a teenage comedy, they expected the average viewer to have enough biblical knowledge to get the joke. Yeah. <laughs> and and these days, you you I don't think you could assume that. I, I, I kind of agree with you. I mean, this is, I think, one of the things that you, you get into some of these online discussions— when you start to talk about we need to preach the word and we need to this is what the word says, there are people who will inevitably come up and claim, oh, people understand. No, they don't. They no, they don't. Absolutely if, don't. If you They're tried to make that taught. joke today, it would go right over their head. Yeah. And and that's the thing is, you know, so the the pure word of God has to be preached. It has to be proclaimed in sermon, in conversation, in counseling. In instruction, the word of God has to be preached. And then the sacraments need to be duly administered. Um, you know, a, a, a church, you know, we're, we're commanded, Jesus commanded us in the, in the Great Commission to make disciples and baptize them. <laughs> I, I actually, I preached through that uh, at the sunrise service for Easter morning. I preached through, I, I actually preached through all of Matthew 28. I did it in 25 minutes, not in a six week series <laughs> or I'm longer. Impressed. Yeah. I, I, it, you know, um, I, it, as, as uh, I was instructed, it's a devotional, not a sermon. There so you go. <laughs> I was go too much in depth and breakfast was waiting. You know, you didn't um, do a John MacArthur's first sermon at I, his uh, church. I did. I did. So I knew that, uh, I knew that breakfast was being cooked back at the church and, uh, I'd have had a lot of angry deacons if I had kept everybody late. Just a little <laughs> bit, I'm sure. They'd been working, they'd been working hard. Um, in addition to the people that were there who would have been ha angry because they were they were ready for breakfast. <laughs> but you know, I end. You know, Matthew 28 ends with the Great Commission, and you know, it says, "Go and make disciples of all the nations," which expanded. God's mandate from the Jewish nation to all nations. Mm -hmm. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to keep all that I commanded you. So I, I the the shorthand is reach the lost and teach the found. Amen. And the ministry of the church needs to be a teaching ministry, which gets back to that pure word of, of God. But the sacraments are, you know, we're, we're commanded there to baptize believers. Um, and I, I do always note that it's make disciples and baptize them. It's not make disciples and baptize their newborn kids. Uh, <laughs> oh, and now the and the comment war starts on the YouTube channel That's in right. three, That's two, right. one. <laughs> I, they can they can take the heat. It's, uh, email me at squirrelchatter at protonmail.com. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> All hate mail to you. No, and, and, and you know what? Yeah. It, they can send it to voice of reason radio at gmail dot com too, because I actually agree with you. So one hundred percent. So, but so we're we're commanded to baptize believers. We're also commanded to celebrate the Lord's table. Jesus did that at the Last Supper. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Paul reiterates it in, in his letter to the Corinthians that, you know, that we are to practice the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table or communion, whatever you call it. Yeah. And these are the two sacraments that were given, sacraments or ordinances, I don't care what you call them. <laughs> these were what were given to the church as witnesses you know the, the the baptism is a is a witness to the world that you are identifying with christ in his death burial and resurrection you are proclaiming yourself to be a christian and and that's an important 
thing that the church does. Mm -hmm. The other thing is these ordinances were given to the church. Yeah. They weren't given to individual Christians. The church baptizes people. I know everybody talks about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and he's, he, you know, okay, if God miraculously transports you out into the desert <laughs> to talk to an Ethiopian eunuch, you're probably okay to baptize him when he converts. But if you have not been supernaturally transported <laughs> out into the middle of the desert, then just relax. <laughs> you know, you've got other things to do. Um, just, yeah, just in the, you know, and that gets us back to the book of Acts being descriptive, not prescriptive. Right. The, the ordinance was given to the church. And so the baptism is done by the church. The Lord's Supper is done in the congregation of the church. It's done in that context. You're, you're eating a saltine and drinking a thimble full of wine as you're watching a service online from your couch is not communion. Right. Um, one of the famous acts that, that, uh, um, uh, Buzz Aldrin did during the first moon landing is right after they landed, yeah. he, he took communion. No, he didn't because it wasn't done in the, in the context of the local church. Yeah. Now, I mean, it was kind of a neat thing that he did that, you know, but, and, and, and in his Anglican tradition, it had a little bit more, you know, meaning to, you know, the way they did it. But I still think it was out of the context of the church. It's not communion. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the sacraments need to be duly min administered. And then all those things that of necessity are requisite. That's referring to, you know, all of the other things that, that a church is to do. And I think there we're talking about, you know, church leadership how right. the church is to function. And, and we get all of that from the epistles. Yeah. That, I mean, the, the epistles were written to the church <laughs> and right. that's where we get our instructions. I mean, of all the, of all the epistles in the new Testament, all but four were actually addressed to churches. Three of the four that were not addressed to churches, three of the four that were addressed to individuals were sent to pastors with instructions for the church. Right. right. The only one that, that was written to an individual and dealing with a, a matter with that individual, although it was also in the context of the church, is Philemon. Yeah. Which was written to, you know, Paul wrote to Philemon about the Philemon's escaped slave Onesimus, who had become a Christian and was now your brother in Christ, and you need to welcome him back. And so, I mean, there's a church context there as yeah. well. You know, so all of the and all of these epistles contain instructions to the church. And and, and I know there's a lot of people I've I've had this thrown at me is like, you know, there's no commandment in the Bible that says you have to be a part of a church. And you're right. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say, now that you're a Christian, go find a local church. It's assumed. Yeah. It's just assumed that every Christian would be part of a local congregation. There's, yeah. it, it's so ubiquitous that it's not even stated openly. Right. But as you read through the New Testament, it's so clear that everyone was just expected to be a part of the church. No, that's absolutely true. I mean, I think that's one of the things that in our modern setting, we don't quite grasp. We're, it's like, we expect to be handheld and hand fed everything without actually having to think through. It's like this word that was given to you, a Christian, instructs you to do certain things. And there's only one way that's going to happen. And it's going to be within the body of Christ. We were talking before we, we started recording the, the, the very idea of the one and others, you know, right. to, to, to love one another, to, you know, to you know, speak to one another in, in, a, in, in, not profane speech, but in ways that build up. You can't do that. I mean, yes, we can talk as we are right now via Zoom or some other platform, but that's not the same as being with someone 
rubbing up on one another, kind of grating on one another, uh, as Todd Frio maybe put it once on Unwretched, and actually learning to to love and to uh, to come alongside, to build up, to strengthen, to use the gifts you've been given specifically for the purpose of edifying the church. You, uh, you're absolutely right. No, there's not an instruction because it is. it would be ludicrous to think you could do those things apart from being a part of the local church. And, you know, kind of going with that whole spoon fed uh, uh, thinking, you were talking about, you know, the, this, uh, the sacraments and talking about, you know, things like we're supposed to, you know, evangelize and we're supposed to disciple and we're supposed to teach them to obey all the, the things that God has commanded us. The church sh- is through the word preaching of the word of God, training the body to do what? to go out and proclaim the word of uh, God to everyone around us. That is not the job of the pastor. That's not the job of the, 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 the team of elders or the deacons. It's not for you to sit back and go, we hired you, pastor, you do it, because he is supposed to be, through the word of God, through the ministry, administration of the sacraments, training you, and you're supposed to go out, and as you proclaim the gospel and you're, pouring you know uh, the the word of god into people then they come to the that church where they're getting built up and trained and yet we have professing christians who never once have told anybody except maybe to say hey come with me to church on sunday or uh it's you know let, nothing. huh it's better than nothing it's better than nothing but maybe yeah. that's what the if they've done that um we're not saying it's a bad thing we're just saying that's that's not what you've been commanded to do in and of itself, it's good. It's, but it's not what you were commanded to do because the church is for what? For believers. And yet we've got this whole, you know, a whole platform that's been designed, bring people to church. We'll get them saved. You sit there and clap and applaud. And that's all you have to do. And that's not, that is utterly backwards from what the church has, has been commanded to do. We are to be an active people. We are to, you know, build one another up. We are to serve one another. We are to uh, use our gifts for the purpose of the church. We're to comfort one another. We're to do all of these things. And the pastors are to train us to do that. Burdens. What's that? Bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. You And so you cannot do those things on your own. That's no. why, and I know people get really cranky about this, but Online church is not a thing. Grant you, there are people who like like Rich, for example. Rich cannot travel a lot because of his his disabilities. So there are people like him who are often trapped at home. And so this is the one way they can be ministered to, at least for the teaching. But that church should be, and it really angers me, and I know this is something that bothers Rich, that churches don't do this well enough. That church should be pouring into their lives, coming alongside them, having people come to them, having the elders and uh, come and visit them, having members of the church, you know, uh, you know, minister to them. And that doesn't happen. Why? Well, they're not butts in a seat. We can't count them on the rolls, except maybe to say we've got this many bodies that we don't technically have inside the church. But they, they're no, there's nobody spending energy, time ministering to those individuals. So they are the exception when you were talking about online, but the church should be doing more to take care of them. But the idea that to any of this, to, to, to go to church online is utterly foreign to what the commandments are. And, and think about this, because I, you know, I listen to a lot of sermons and watch a lot of sermons. I've got, you know, I, I, there's, there's usually four or five sermons that I'll catch every week from the previous Sunday of friends that pastor churches. You know, I've, I've got a friend that pastors in, in Hilton Head. I like to watch his sermons. I've got a friend that pastors in Santa Clarita. I watch his sermons. I watch John MacArthur's sermons. I watch, um, uh, uh, John Benzinger's sermons out of, out of Gilbert, Arizona, there's, there's certain people that I, I catch their sermons every week. When I'm traveling, I'll watch my own pastor's sermons. Um, even though, you know, I try to go to church when I'm traveling, 
Mm -hmm. I'll still later in the week, I'll watch his sermon because he's preaching through first Corinthians right now. And I want to keep up, <laughs> but there is a, there is a difference. There is a palpable difference between sitting in the pew while the sermon is being preached and watching the sermon yes. on YouTube. Absolutely. A palpable difference. There is an intangible element <laughs> to being gathered with the church under the teaching of the word. Um, I, I was noticing that just the other day. I was, you know, just down at Shepherd's Conference a few weeks ago. And and I, they've just released the videos. And so I was going back and watching you know, the, the main sessions. They didn't right. release everything. They've got the audio of everything is out and then the video of the main yes. session. And one of the 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 most impactful message that I heard at the at the conference was from H. B. Charles, and it was on prayer. And it was just, I mean, it hit me. It was it was the most convicting message that he, that I heard there was on prayer and 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 you know the prayer life and the importance of the prayer life. And I think none of us think our prayer lives are great, <laughs> you know. I mean, I think about guys like, uh, you know, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Paul Washer over the years. And, yeah, you know, I can't think of a more godly person that that I personally acquainted with. Yeah. That, that is just so sincere and so devout. And he's the one, you know, he, he tells you his prayer life isn't. And you listen to his prayers and you're broken down into tears. Yeah. He's like, he's not satisfied with his prayer life. I don't think any of us are. That And that's a man who almost missed his sermon at G3 because he was off praying and they had to sharing, find him. He was sharing the gospel, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so you, you, you look at this and so I'm listening to this message and it, it really was impactful. And then I went back and watched the video and it's not nearly as impactful. You know, it's been three weeks since I've seen it. It's still, it's a great message, but there was something about being there, mm -hmm. sitting in the pew, looking up at the man at the pulpit, listening to the word of God. And I, you know, there's, there's a, there's something about doing it in the context that you don't get from a video screen. And, and that's, you know, it's a bigger difference between being being in the pew during a sermon and watching a sermon online than it is watching a movie in the theater and watching the same movie on a DVD. Yeah, it's a there's there's something palpably different about being there in person while the the pure word of God is preached. Absolutely, and I think that's just somehow God designed us that way I think to it is. that we we respond. I can, you know, I, I can turn on uh, an instructional video. I can turn on a sermon. I can do whatever. And I can be distracted a million different ways. And guess what? The video will never know. It will yeah. have no. Now, if you got smart devices, it knows. But <laughs> sorry. Different Are you still watching? <laughs> yeah. Are you still watching? Yeah. Netflix. Uh, but when you sit there and eat, that pastor is staring into the congregation preaching that's going to grab your attention because you are actually interacting, even if you're just sitting there taking notes, right. uh, which please do take notes. You, you, you actually will learn more. Um, but we digital technology, I mean, look, I'm a, I'm a, uh, a gadget nut. I, you know, if it's new and it's shiny, it's got, you know, touchy feely things. I'm crazy about it, but we weren't designed that way. We were designed to engage all of our senses and a Kindle, a, a, an iPad or whatever versus, you know, okay, y'all can see the books over here. That's only half of my wall. But um, there is something tangible, palpable about cracking that binding and running your finger across the pages that you read and absorb more. Every reader will tell you that. And the same thing comes with being there in person, learning from the individual that's preaching to you. You are engaging all of those senses. 
And I'm for, and if you're somebody like me, who's easily prone to distraction, it's, I'll learn far less watching the video screen than I will. If I, if I'm sitting there literally 10, 15 feet from my pastor, because I tend to sit up toward the, the front. Um, so you tend to be more engaged and because, and I think that's how God designed it to be. God did not design us to be disconnected the way we have become in this culture. And I think we saw that we, we've all recognized it with what happened with COVID. Yeah. You know, when everything got shut down and we were all separated. The, they, they've shown that the, the students who were mm-hmm. not in class who were watching video, they didn't learn as well. No, we were and, not designed for that. Yeah. And, and so there, there is a, there is the, we're designed to be in person. Now we say that we're both podcasters. We want people to listen to our podcast. Yes. We, want, yes. we to, to teach people um, in our podcasting, but it's not podcasts are not a substitute for the local church. Not at all. And I, 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 yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to be a supplement. I'm yeah. happy to, you know, if, if, if I'm doing scripture reading at, 7:30 a.m. Mountain on X, Facebook, and Rumble. Um, if I'm doing scripture reading on Squirrel Chatter, you know I've had people say, "Hey, you know, when you read through the Legacy Standard Bible in a year, that's the first time I've made it all the way through the Bible." You know, I haven't gotten bogged down in Leviticus. I kept going. <laughs> We're doing it every day, and and so you know, it helps. Yes, it does. And and so you know, I'm trying to do you know that daily daily time in the word and that daily devotional time um, and help people that way. But that's not the church. Exactly. And, and I mean, it is important. I think as important as it is, and I think it's extremely important for everybody to pick up this book every day and spend time in it. As important as that is, it's more important to be in your pew on Sunday. No. And I just, that's the thing. It's like you, you are commanded to study and learn from that. I mean, we're, we're to be students of the word, but you're one of the reasons we're placed in that environment where we have elders and authority over us is so that I don't pick this, you know, pick this up and um, I don't get off into some weird wacky tangent. Right. Because, God has gifted those individuals, specific individuals who have specific requirements. Gender First being, Timothy three, yeah, Titus one, gender being one of them. Uh, yes, one. Not not the imaginary gender that we have today. Um, but uh, I'm gonna get in trouble. Did you, I, I, I'm sorry. I just thinking about. I, I read our dear president's <laughs> proclamation of. You know he didn't write that, by the way. I know he didn't. It write made that. too much sense. But the thing that that just <laughs> cracked me up was in the 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 tweet from the official account um, that was you know that had the screenshot of the the proclamation itself. But in the tweet, it said they're made in the image of God, and all I could think was he's right, but finish the verse. Yeah. You know, it says he made them in the image of God, male and female. He, he made, made them. It's the same verse. And that's what's correct. But again, that goes back to goes being back under to the, some, the authority of qualified preachers. And by okay. the way, the other thing that's hysterical about that proclamation in the year of our Lord, 2024. Yes, I caught that too. That was amusing. And I, was, I, I had missed that until somebody pointed it out. And I went, oh, my word. It's like, but, you know what? Whoever actually penned that is going to stand before God one day and every vile word that's ever come from their mouth, including that blasphemy, they'll be held accountable for. I just, I sit (sighs) here and I, I think God is so much more patient than I am (laughs) because I would be raining lightning bolts down. I'd be like James and John. (laughs) Shall we call down fire? (laughs) I, I'm like, you know, I, 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 I see some of these people say this stuff and I just kind of wince. Yeah. Like, oh, you know, please repent. Yeah. Please don't go with that yeah. into the courtroom of the most holy yeah. almighty God 
with that uncovered. Amen. Amen. And, and if you, I mean, it's repent and believe the gospel and be saved because brother, you do not want to stand up and have that read out in the courtroom. Yeah, absolutely not. And that's, yeah. that goes back to, I mean, we're watching what's happening right now. I mean, we saw for many years where basically Christians have been trying to be quieted and nullified and it, it hasn't worked. Right. So now they're trying to basically steal Christianity and say, no, we're the actual real Christians. You're the quote unquote fake Christians. And it goes back to, these are people who are not under the authority of a qualified preacher who have not actually read the Bible for themselves, who are so not never a, repented and believed, who've never repented and believed, who have never been taught to repent and re believe and are not, you know, attending the local church. They are, maybe they go somewhere where there's a really nice Ted talk, but it's, and, and it labels itself a church, but it's yeah, not a church. A good band. Yeah. They got a great band. I'm sure. Uh, well, if you don't mind reporting like it, a, 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 the same chorus 23 times, but, uh, <laughs> The, but the point being is that this coming back to full circle, what we were just talking about with the whole local church, this is why God designed it the way it was designed. And for anybody to say, well, you're not commanded to be part of a local church, brother, that's sister, that's boring. why, why we are dealing with what we're dealing with. We have people who want to call themselves Christians. I, I saw a post, I kid you not. I, I think it was one of these people who call themselves trans or, and said that they're a Christian but like study Hinduism and, and pra study and practice Hinduism or something like, you, no, you're not, you, you're not even remotely Christian. You don't you're even understand what the term is. Admitting to idolatry. Right. right and it's like, you don't have any concept of what the term means. And you, we've got this just massive attempt at taking, and by the way, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That's God's, pro that's Christ's promise to us. But you have this massive attempt to, thwart and overtake the church for godless reasons. And you want to tell me you don't need to come under the authority. How are you going to know which one's the actual church? Right. And I think that's, that's, you know, when you come down, the pure word of God is preached. The sacraments are duly administered. The church is led by biblically qualified men who are focused on teaching the word of God. Um, that's the, you know, I mean, music style, I have my preferences and I'll tell you something. I duly love my church. <laughs> if I was in charge of the music, I'd change some things. <laughs> I'm not, yep. that's not my thing. And you know what? I sing heartily to songs I don't particularly care for. Actually, that's not the way I say it. I like all the music we sing and it's all doctrinally sound, but some of it I don't think is designed for congregational singing. Right. And, and that's where I, that's my issue. Right. That's not really, a, you know, that's a song to be performed. It's a song to be enjoyed. It's not really a song mm -hmm. for, you know, it's, yep. it's it, the, the churchy karaoke thing. Um, and, <laughs> and, and that's, that's not all of our music by right. any means, but, you know, I always tell people, you know, you're looking for a church, which, you know, back to why we we got into this in the first place. You're looking for a church. I always tell people, grab an eight and a half by 14 legal pad, not one of the little ones, one of the long ones, you know, <laughs> get one of those long eight and a half by 14 yellow legal pads and write down absolutely everything you want in a church. Everything. Music style. You know, pews or chairs, color of the carpet. What, you know, what songs do they sing? It, piano, organ, guitar, drums. What do you want? Everything. Does the, te does the preacher wear a tie every Sunday? Does nobody wear a tie every Sunday? I mean, write down absolutely everything you want in a church. Then when you've completed that list, I mean, and spend a few days on it, you know, set it aside, come back to it. You know, spend a week on it going through until you have a list of your ideal church, then crumple that thing up and throw it away because you're not going to find that church. Amen. Amen. And so then get to, okay, what do I need in a church? And what you need in a church is a church that is 
centered, uh, a church that's for the church. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Church that is for believers. So eliminate all the quote unquote seeker sensitive churches. They're not geared for believers. They're geared for unbelievers. That's not the calling of the church. Nope. The purpose of the church, as Paul says in Ephesians, is to equip the saints, that's the believers, for the work of the ministry. The church service every week is the church gathered. And that doesn't mean that unbelievers aren't welcome there. And it doesn't believe that, you know, you shouldn't invite people to church. But that's for the church. And we can allow people that aren't in the church to observe. But that's for the church. You know, we gather for edification. We scatter to evangelize. <laughs> you know, you evangelize the people at the coffee shop. You evangelize the people you work with. You evangelize the the taxi driver who ta who's taking you to the airport. Yeah. You evangelize the, you know, old lady after you help her across the street. Take every opportunity. But that's the church scattered. Yeah. The church gathers for edification. So look for a church that is believer-centered, believer-focused. It's not focused, the, and, and I don't want to be misunderstood. The church service isn't focused on evangelism. Right. Now, the church should be focused on evangelism, yes. but the church service shouldn't be focused on evangelism. The church service should be focused on preaching the pure word of God and edifying the believers. Um, doesn't mean you don't preach the gospel because, you know, I love to tell the story who knows who know, know it best. They're hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest, you know. Um, we need to proclaim the gospel to, to ourselves. But the church gathers, you know, so the church gathering needs to be focused on the church, yeah. not on the world. And it needs to be, you know, as a, led by biblically qualified men. First Timothy three, Titus one gives the qualifications for for elders, and elder, pastor, and overseer are all the same office. Yes, <laughs> you know, um, that's that's been a that you know that you you look at those three terms in the scripture; they are all used interchangeably you know in one case they're called elders in another case they're called overseers it's the same office um i love how peter says to the elders pastor the flock <laughs> you know which tells you right there that the elders are the pastors amen so that that and that's an office that is that is limited to biblically qualified men and i i always laugh that you know well, you may saying women can't be pastors. Not only am I saying women can't be pastors, I'm saying most men can't. This is a, a, a selective group of men, you know, and God has given us the qualifications for who should be in this role. And while those those moral qualifications that you know, the only the only qualification that is ability is the ability to teach. The rest of them are all moral qualifications, yeah. you know, and th those moral qualifications are the standard that every Christian should strive for. But there are, even among that group, there, you know, it's like when you get a, any group is going to have a leader. Any group is going to mm -hmm. have leaders, going to have people that step to the front. Um, I have a friend that played pro football. He only played for about three, four years. But he talked about, you know, when he got to college, every player on his college team had been the star of his high school team. <laughs> you know, the, every player in his college team had been the star of yep. his high school. So they were all leaders. But then in that group, there were some of them who were the leaders yeah. of that. Yep. He said, and then the the jump to the pros. He said every every player he played with in the pros was the star of his college team. Yeah, exactly. You know, bigger jump. 
Yeah. But even then, you had leaders emerge. Any group is going to have leaders. And this is the qualifications, First Timothy 3 and Titus 1, that God has given for the leaders. So we want a believer-focused church, as far as the, the, the ministry of the church, is focused on equipping the saints for the work of ministry. It's a word-centered church. It's a church that is led by biblically qualified elders. And then, you know, that's what you're looking for. Yeah. You know, the pure word is preached, the sacraments are administered, you've got the the church. Um, you know, it, and it practices church discipline. Yeah. 18. It has, you know, it's a pure church. It's a church that takes God's word seriously enough that it calls out people who are sinning. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, church discipline is not designed to kick people out of the church. <laughs> no. Nope. Purpose of church discipline is corrective. And, you know, church discipline happens all the time. Church discipline happens when an elder or a deacon calls up the family that always sits on the fifth pew on the left that hadn't been there in three weeks. Yeah. Says, Hey, we've been missing you guys at church. What's going on? That's church discipline. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of times, Oh, we just got busy. You know, well, we'd love to see you back. Will you be here on Sunday? Yeah, we'll be here. Boom. Church discipline is over. Exactly. You know, but church discipline happens all the time. Church discipline happens when you see somebody, you know, in, in, you know, that's been missing church or, you know, you, you, you see your, uh, see a man, you know, say something to his wife. He probably shouldn't have in public. Mm -hmm. And you just quietly come alongside him and say, hey, brother, what's going on? You know, that wasn't, that wasn't a proper thing you said, you know, it, is there something going on? Is there something, yeah. you know, and take him to the word, love your, love your wife as Christ loved the church and and walk them through that and that's church discipline it, it's not you know the elder board sitting around talking about the problem child <laughs> now if they reach that point could get there eventually exactly it doesn't but anytime two believers get together and one of them is gently trying to correct the other on a point of doctrine on a bit of behavior you know, big or small, you know, I mean, you know, and, and the thing, this is one of the things that, that I hate gossip and God does too. If you listen to, you know, if you, you're driving down the street and you see somebody, you know, from church and they're coming out of a shop they shouldn't be in or coming out of a, a place they probably ought not to be, you go to them, you know, you don't put it out on the prayer chain. <laughs> go to them and you know it might be um i mean i've i've had situations like this where somebody was seen coming out of a bar and you go talk to him and he said yeah you know i got a call from a friend of mine and he was in there and you know i was going to go get the car because i was taking him home you know he yeah. called me you know then you know, oh that's why he was there. It may not be what you thought. Yeah, exactly. So you 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 deal with that then. But you know, if you if if all you did was you know, I saw Chris coming out of the bar the other night. You know, no context. You don't know. You know, because that may not have been why you were there. Yeah. And even and if it was, I mean, it it could be you know. It could they, be innocent. It there could, could be innocent be enough. You know? Talk to somebody. Yeah. You know. So I mean, that's that's uh, the that's the ideal is that you're doing that in a biblical way. If you and if you're in a church that's teaching those things, you know to do that. If you have a church right. that doesn't practice proper churches and isn't demonstrating, or does it selectively? Like, there's a certain group we don't mess with because that might mess with the tides. But everybody yeah. else will will be you know will will show that little bit of partiality to the other group, then you're you're going to get people who will not practice it. And one of the things that you know is is just keeps running through my mind as you're talking about this is that a biblically informed church, a church that's doing the things the way Scripture calls it to do uh, calls us to do it, 
is primarily concerned with what God wants. It 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 cares about honoring God, glorifying his name, submitting to his will and being conformed to the image of Christ. You know, one of the things that's been on my mind lately is we we often see like the 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 seeker friendly church, you know, 10 steps to a better marriage, 12 steps to better kids, 13 steps to a better you, whatever. It's all about conforming you to what you think your life should be versus a biblical church is going to challenge everything in you that says, this is what I want my life to look like. But it's instead, it's going to say, that may be what you want, but that may not be what God wants. And so God is our, our primary concern. And guess what? You know, he's commanded you to do A, B, C, and D. Not because it may make life more comfortable for you. Maybe God will bless you in that way. But guess what? Doing A, B, C, D, and D might give you the life of Paul, where you're shipwrecked and you're you know you're you're being stoned and left for dead and being chased from town to town and being persecuted. Guess what? That's God's a blessing as well, and He's using that to conform you to the image of Christ. So a church that you know seeks to Biblically qualified elders, elders, biblical uh, you know, a form of church discipline, doing the one another's, equi- equipping one another, uh, doing discipleship, all of these things, being you know, practicing the sacraments, preaching the word, is doing so because their primary love is Jesus Christ, and they want to honor Him regardless of what the worldly outcomes would be, and most professing churches, evangelical churches in Western culture today are trying to be about pleasing man. You were saying it before, the recruitment center style church. You right. know, you're going to put the recruitment sergeant up on the stage and he's going to give you this great flowery message with anybody's ever been in the military will tell you is complete garbage. So you never want to listen to that. But that's what we're going to put up on the stage. We're going to make you all these promises. And in the meantime, we're doing nothing to equip the people in the body of Christ to be conformed to the image of Christ. That is a reversal and it cares more about man. It is a worship of man. A biblical church will worship God and will tell you to be obedient regardless of what the outcomes in this life would look like. I, I was in a discussion um, about the liturgical calendar recently. <laughs> Um, Because, of course, we just, you know, we had Lent leading up to Easter. Before that, we had Advent leading up to Christmas. And and, um, someone says, oh, it's just, I can't stand the liturgical calendar. And I'm like, every church has a liturgical calendar. Look at the seeker-sensitive churches. You know, it's it's right around Valentine's Day. You're going to get a five-part series on love and marriage. It's around tax time. You're going to get a series on finances. It's, you know, it's summertime, you're going to get a series on recreation. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to, they, they, they have a liturgical calendar. It's just not a biblical Amen. liturgical calendar. <laughs> Amen. And, you know, and it's just like, you know, I'd rather do the one that the Christian church has been doing for millennia than doing the one that the, that the secular culture does. Um, one of the things that, that, you know, you talk about the traditions of men and how, cultural cultures do things that um japan is i'm not sure the exact number it's like two or three percent christian in japan yet one of the biggest holidays every year is christmas yeah it's a huge thing it's their version of valentine's day that's a time when (laughs) when young men take their young ladies out to a fancy restaurant and buy him flowers and stuff is Christmas. Um, what's really funny is the the traditional Japanese Christmas meal is Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> because some entre- enterprising KFC uh, franchise owner in Japan started marketing it as that's the great. traditional American Christmas that's, dinner. That's brilliant. That's I mean, brilliant. You have to order your bucket of chicken <laughs> like six, eight weeks before Christmas if you're going to get it for Christmas. That's a, that's absolutely you know, brilliant. It is, it's huge. <laughs> and, and, and the whole thing is that it has nothing to do with Christmas. Um, I was thinking about, you know, 
which is exactly what our Christmas is. Yeah. Our Christmas has nothing to do with Christmas. You know, now I happen to have quite a bit of respect for the actual historical St. Nicholas. You know, he punched a heretic. That's, you know, you, you got to give a guy props for that. And, but, you know, the historical St. Nicholas was a Turkish bishop. He wasn't, yeah. you know, a Scandinavian <laughs> guy, you know, and, and so it's, you know, I mean, even the name Santa Claus comes from St. Nicholas. Claus is a nickname for Nicola yeah. and St. Nicholas. Yep. Santa, Saint, Santa Claus. Yeah. Claus. I mean, it, you know, it comes from a guy who really lived in the 300s, you know, who was most likely at the Council of Nicaea in 325. And I really, really hope actually did punch Aries. Although like, we, can, we can we get a replay on that when we get to heaven, Lord, please. I want to I want to see that. Yeah, I'll throw I want to see the tape. Red, throw the throw the little red uh, red <laughs> bandana to, to call for a replay on that. I want to watch some. <laughs> yeah, and I hope it's true. Yeah. I, I would dearly love it to be true. Um, <laughs> we don't know for sure, but we've developed culturally this cultural mindset and it's infected what the culture calls yeah. church yeah that's exactly and, it. and so i mean that is a problem and when people are talking about you know how do i find a good church there are a lot of places that call themselves churches that aren't and when we say you're supposed to be a part of a local church we're not saying go anywhere yeah there's a lot of places I don't want you to ever go. You know, there are, you know, places that deny the, the scriptures, deny the deity of Christ, deny, you know, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and yet they call themselves churches. Yeah. Not. They have rainbow flags on they the have front. Rainbow flags. <laughs> they have, I just saw a story. I don't know where it happened. I was just it, it it came up on on X and I, I uh, looked at it briefly, but I didn't uh, I, I didn't do a lot of research, so I don't remember where it was. It may have been Minneapolis. That seems to stick in my mind. If it's not, I apologize. But the, it was it was last June. There was a a church with a woman pastor who was an open lesbian. And somebody tore the gay pride flag down off the outside of their church and burnt it. The, he was caught. He pled guilty. He was sentenced today to 16 years in prison. What? Yeah. I'm thinking this was what, you know, misdemeanor criminal mischief, maybe a $500 fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's, no, ridi that's, that's utterly ridiculous. ridiculous. They charged him with, theft of property they charged i mean and he was sentenced today to 16 years in prison for burning a 20 dollar flag well and i'll tell you i mean there are some brothers whose certain ideologies i don't always agree with but one thing they are correct about is we do have blasphemy laws in this country it's just a question of whose religion exactly that is very true so um oh brother i know we're we're little over an hour mark and I want to respect your time but um is as you know we've we've really covered a lot of ground in terms of what a biblical church looks like what it what the practice of it is why there's so many other churches that bear that name but really aren't um as we let people go what what would you want to leave them with in terms of uh why is this important? Why do we need to be concerned about it? And then what do they do in terms of pers uh, finding a, a local church? Right. You you have to be a part of a local church. I think we've covered that. So to find a local church, find, you know, use, use the tools that are out there. You know, search good seminaries for alumni-led churches in your area. Search like the G3 Church Network to see if there's a member church in your area. 
uh, Founders Mem Mem Ministries has a church search. There, there are several good church search engines to see what's in your area. Um, word of mouth. Talk to other Christians. I mean, if, if you're a Christian in a town, you probably know other Christians. Visit their church. But what it comes down to is once you have, you know, you can eliminate, you know, the churches with the women pastors and the and the the uh, the gay pride flag in front of the door. You can eliminate, you know, all these things, different things here and there. But once you have done that and you've narrowed it down to a group of churches, then you have to go spend time in the pew. You have to go talk to the pastor. You can't. You know, there are churches that have on their website really, really good statements of faith that look like, hey, this is a church I could go to. They may not follow it. You know, they it, they may just be giving lip service to it. So you really have to talk to the elders. You have to sit in the pew for a few weeks and get a feel for the church. And so you may have to visit multiple churches. That's fine. You know, it's it's worth the effort. Um, it's it's you know find a good church, and you know it's not. We do live in a day and age when we we all have automobiles, or most of us, we're we're not restricted to walking distance of our house. If if you have to drive an hour, an hour and a half, you know, I mean, I, I know a lot of people that drive a couple of hours to work every day. Well, what's more important, a solid church or your job? And if you say your job, your priorities are wrong. So it, it's, it's very important to be a part of a lo local church. And yes, you're going to have to do your due diligence to find one that you would at to attend. Um, the church where I attend now, um, since I retired from the, the pastorate, it was the church I was in in high school. A really good friend was one of my elders there, was one of the elders there when we started attending. I've been friends with the pastor for, for several years. Um, I'm always looking at the churches around me and getting a good feel of them um, so that I can recommend churches to people um but that's i can do that where i live i can't do that where you live so you're gonna have to do some legwork to find a good church but once you find a good church you commit to it you don't leave at the drop of a hat you don't leave because the building committee decided to take out the flower beds and just put down gravel because it was less work to maintain. You don't leave because the building and grounds committee decided not to repave the, the parking lot because it was too expensive. You don't leave because they changed the color of the curtains. You, you're committed to it's it's joining a church is like getting married. You don't end a relationship with a church over minor issues. Um, you, 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 if, if you leave a church, it needs to be over a serious issue. Like, you know, the preaching of heresy, yeah, <laughs> the painting of women, something, you know, it's not because they played a song you didn't like, or because they decided to add drums to the, to the worship band. Um, that's not a reason to leave. And as I said, you know, if you make a big list of things that are in your perfect church, throw it away because you're going to put up with things you don't like. Just like in a marriage, my wife has to put up with me and I do things she doesn't always like. And, and, and sadly, it's the other way too. You know, <laughs> there are times my wife does things that I'm not real happy about. And that's just reality that's part of living in a post Genesis three world. And if you're a mature person, you need to deal with that. And so people often don't, 
And, and that's just a matter of being a mature person, but, you know, find a good church and build your life around it. Um, that is, you know, do the one and others <laughs> sit under the teaching of the word, get involved. Don't just warm a pew, you know, look for where you are to serve. Every Christian has been given gifts by the Holy spirit for the purpose of serving the church, you know, and, we all have different gifts and I mean, it's, it's, you know, I can't tell you how many church toilets I've cleaned <laughs> more than one. Amen. Amen. Because you do something needs to be done. You do it. Um, I love, you know, just thinking about our church yesterday and um, just after breakfast, all of a sudden there, you know, 10 or 12 guys, packing up all the tables, putting away all the chairs. And, and it was just like, you know, and this is, it's not like we're renting a place. This is our basement. None of that stuff was going anywhere. Yeah. But they had that entire fellowship hall cleaned up after breakfast before service started. You know, I had to leave and go to choir practice. So I'd have been there. helping. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, uh, you know, be a part of the church and, and being a part of the church does mean you have to put up with some things you don't particularly like. Um, but it doesn't mean, you know, and even, you know, we're the, the importance of the, the word of God being faithfully taught, you know, you're going to have doctrinal differences. I don't know of any two individuals <laughs> who are absolutely 100% agreed on every point of doctrine. Amen. Um, I, you know, some of my, I, I look at the 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 friendship between uh, John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul before he passed away. And I'm thinking there was so much that these guys didn't agree on, but they loved each other yeah. and, and accepted each other as brothers. And neither one could have been a member of the other's church. Because, and, and there is a place for those doctrinal differences. You know, I mean, we talked about we're Baptists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we believe in baptizing believers, not baptizing children. That doesn't mean that I don't have good brothers who are in pedo baptistic churches. I do. I, ju I disagree with them. Yep. I couldn't be a part of their church. That doesn't mean I couldn't visit their church and worship with them. You know, I just, I, I could not join that church. Amen. And that's, you know, so you, you don't look for the perfect church. It's not there. And no. So, okay. You prefer gray carpet. They have green. How <laughs> often do you sit looking at the carpet anyway? <laughs> you know, you'll get used to it. You know, and I would just, I, I would add, I mean, we were talking about being podcasters and, and at best we are supportive, it's a tertiary. Right. I, this is where those doctrinal differences, folks, and, and you may have heard this, I forget who it was that shared it. Do not let your favorite podcast or favorite sermon source be a competition for that local church. There right. are there uh, there was somebody who shared. I, I I wish I could remember who it was. Just just a couple months ago, of a body of men within the church that were starting to cause. I I'm going to say probably some division, because they were following a certain group of ideologically driven Christians, and the podcasts and and stuff that they were putting out. And there, the church wasn't going that direction, and it was causing friction. And it's like, I, this goes back to what you're saying. It's like you're going to have. We're not talking about doctrinal issues of, like, you know, hyper dispensationalism, where they say, "Oh, well, Jesus wasn't talking to you; Paul was," or, or something. We're talking about interpretations of what Scripture means and how that's applied in in modern day, for example. Your church doesn't go down that path, but maybe you you know have a different take. That is not a reason to one leave a church, nor is it how dare you ever cause division, because a supportive uh, tool that the Lord has made available to you 
has informed you in such a way as now you don't agree on something with your pastors. That's that was heartbreaking. It was disturbing, and, and quite honestly, wanted me wanted uh, caused me to want to go find some young upstarts, grab them by the scruff of the neck, and have a talk. Yeah. Um, and and sadly, I think even within our own circles of people who would argue what a biblical church should look like, we are experiencing some of that because we're not willing to be challenged in our understanding of things by our pastors and elders. No, no, no. Pastors and elders need to listen to me because I I understand this now because I've read this or I've 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 learned from these people and you need to come alongside. Uh, brothers, sisters, that's wrong. It, it should never happen. I mean, literally if you're at that stage, go find a church that that would, you know, maybe hold to those ideologies, but if you can't find one, then humble yourself because you ain't running that place. God doesn't put you in that position to do so. And and that's that's been one of the big problems with, in in my opinion, the church planning movement. Yeah, I can't find the perfect church. I'm going to go start it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's my way or the highway, at my my little perfect church, which of course isn't perfect. Um, it never is. You know, and if it, and if it was, churches, it, you ruined it when you joined it. <laughs> churches should plant churches. Yeah. That's not very firm about that. Church Amen. Should play. Amen. That's then. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's the thing that I know we're going long, but it's the thing that, you know, we were talking about the fact that the church, that a lot of churches aren't teaching the word. I think one of the things that needs to be focused on as far as teaching for many churches is teaching the doctrine of the church amen amen teaching ecclesiology because so many churches and and i put that in quotes because a lot of them aren't true churches but so much of christendom has such a weak ecclesiology they don't a lot of these people aren't in church because they have no concept of the importance of the church. And, and, and so much of it is a, it comes out of that seeker sensitive movement. It's a consumer driven mentality where people go to a church and it's, what am I getting out of this? Yeah. You know, I'm not interested in Mexican today. Let's go have barbecue. Right. You know, we do that with the place we're going to go to eat lunch. We don't do that with the place we're going to go sit under the teaching of the word. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, that's such a, you know, when, when, when that consumer mentality and what I'm getting at, what is that church going to do for me? Yeah. Oh, it's, how are you going to serve the church? And and so, you know, the, the, the doctrine of ecclesiology really needs to be stressed. Amen. Amen in in the teaching of the church um i think that's probably what most new members classes should be about is just ecclesiology this is what the church is this is how the church works straight from the scripture don't don't offer an opinion don't talk about how we do things talk about what the bible says amen and as you do that if you realize what we do and how we do things isn't what the bible says change (laughs) amen amen and and that's that's directed at the leaders of the church. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Absolutely agree with that. Well, brother, I want to thank you for for coming on and uh, and taking time to go through this because it. I I said at the beginning, I don't think we think en- enough about this topic. Um, yeah. There's so many di- discussions and debates that we do have, and I think they're all worthy topics. But the idea of what is the church? What is it for? Why did God ordain it? What does it look like? What am I supposed to be part of? How do I participate in it? Um, we don't do that enough, and we, you and I see the fruit of that, and um, the sad truth about it is, is it, it affects a broad spectrum from the most liberal, wackadoodle place you can find that calls itself a church to very conservative places, yet not getting it right on this issue, not understanding the whole point. You, your church is not a platform you, for you to, <clears throat> excuse me, espouse an ideology. Your church is there so that you can honor God and glorify His name how, in whatever way He calls you. And whether you are in a, 
a John MacArthur style church or an R.C. Sproul style church, or, or or you're in, you know, you know, a deepest part of Africa. You're 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 in a in a house church in North Korea where you know you could lose your life for praising Christ. You know, uh, the church has a structure. It may not all look the same in terms of what you know where we go, but what it is designed to be and what it's designed to look like and what it's to, how it's designed to function, that should be something across the board. And as you say, brother, that is something every new Christian uh, should be learning. And you know what? There's a lot of pastors that need to learn that too, um, that have not been well educated. They sh- they sure have been educated on. Uh, Madison Avenue sales techniques, but they have not been taught what the church is supposed to be. And so I appreciate this. Hopefully this will be something that blesses a lot of people. So uh, any f- final thoughts before we let it, uh, let everybody go? Just the importance of looking for a good church. You know, if you don't, if you're, if you're not in a good church or if you can't find a good church in your area, Looking for a church is as important as, you know, looking for a pile of gold. You know, I, 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 you know, I picture, you know, some of these guys, you know, treasure hunting in the Amazon and all the rigor they go through to hack their way through Mm -hmm. the jungle because they're trying to find something, you know, kind of a Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of thing where you've got this treasure and you're going to go find it. And it's worth finding and it's worth hardship to go find it. So, you know, finding a good church is, you know, search diligently. Don't give up. You never stop searching. You know, it's, 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 you know, until you find it, it's like a starving man searching for food. You know, you don't give up because if you give up, you die. You know, well, a, you know, a good church that preaches the word of God and practices the sacraments and is biblically led and, and obeying the word of God, that search is, that church is going to feed our souls. And if your soul is starving, you keep searching until you find sustenance. Amen. And so it, it is, I think it's, it's more important than a lot of people are willing to, to give it credit for. Amen over 60 one another commands in the new testament you can't do those one another commands if you're not with one another amen amen not forsake the gathering together of the saints (laughs) (laughs) amen and by the way if you can drive hours and hours to go to your favorite sporting event and get dressed up for that or a conference or a uh comic convention or whatever it is, you can make the effort to get to a, ch- a local church, brother and sister. Um, and like I said, local is a lot bigger area than it yeah. used to be. Oh yeah. I mean, we drive 45 minutes for ours and I think some we people, drive 35. yeah. And it's like, I think some people kind of balk at that idea and it's like, nope. I, I am grateful to be able to drive there every week and, and be part of that church. So praise God for that, that. That's the only distance I have to drive to do it. So well, brother, I uh, just want to thank you once again, folks. Uh, Gene Clyatt, Squirrel Chatter, you need to check him out every day. Uh, get to uh, I'll put the link to uh, the uh, Christian podcast community side of it where you can find his program. Definitely want you to, to tune in. He has some great content every single morning with the rare exception of like when lightning strikes and wipes out your computer. Uh, yes. It did happen. <laughs> Everything's on surge protectors now. Everything was on surge protectors. That came through the phone line. Yeah. I remember your, it just fried everything. Fried everything. Yeah, we're we're up and running and and a lot more protection now than we did. So, but I definitely want you guys to check that out. You can find him on Twitter or at, excuse me, X. Elon, a different name, please. X, it sounds like you're talking about a drug. Squirrel Chat Pod. (laughs) At Squirrel Chat Pod. Uh, And and then uh, you can find him is there as well. And you will always be blessed by the stuff. And you'll find all kinds of fun stuff about squirrels. So... (laughs) 
<laughs> Plus the fact that Rich terrifies uh, our good buddy here because Rich has no problem with the idea of eating squirrels. So, <laughs> you had to give him a hard time for that. <laughs> so, all so right, that's folks. That's a long running joke between the two of us. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, all right, folks, thank you again. So grateful that you guys were patient with us. And those of you who watched the YouTube, not once, but twice, my camera decided to freeze on me and you had all kinds of weird image glitching. I'm still learning how to do YouTube. So, bear with me. I don't know what I'm doing, apparently. So <laughs> with that said, thank you guys so much. God bless you. And we will see you next time. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please email us at voiceofreasonradio at gmail.com or go slave to the king.com and hit us on the contact us link. Whatever you do this week, number one, as my brother Rich always says, go find someone to proclaim the, the biblical way of salvation to. And number two, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. God bless you guys. Good night. We will see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.